<coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you very much for your um, for having accepted our invitation. And on behalf of all of you, I'd like to thank Mr. Aftar Khan, who is doing a great job, and who has accepted to host to help us have this room where we are holding our conference. And I, on behalf of you too, I'd like to thank Mr. Avi Tawil and Mr. De uh, Bert de Reuter for having accepted our invitation to show that we have plenty of things to share and in common and that we can work together to promote peace and living together in the European context, which is ours. Uh, so there is, a growing content, there is a growing feeling of discontent in today's Europe. The terrorist attacks in Paris and Brussels, the refugee crisis, the European jihadists in Syria, and the financial crisis are factors that aggravate this condition of unbehagen in der Kultur, to use Sigmund Freud's words, uneasiness. However, unlike the uneasiness described by Freud, as being the result of a fundamental tension between individual quest of instinctive freedom and repressive civilization, today's malaise in Europe stems primarily from a predisposition to aggression from the part of collective identities facing each other at daggers drawn. Our crisis today is not only a crisis of individuals seeking answers, for existential questions, but also a crisis of groups, entities, blocks desperately in need of codes to live together, to share the same time and space. Does wisdom matter in this context of uneasiness, malaise, unbehagen, or discontent? When we look back at history of attempts at reconciling warring identities, we are rather inclined to adopt a pessimistic, unwise stance, similar to the one articulated in E.M. Forster's, the British writer, declaration when he said, I think that most Indians, like most English people, are shits. Sorry. For, however successful the individual talent might be when it comes to harmonizing different cultural belongings, the risk of emotional collapsing under the weight of fighting ideologies and warring camps remains very high. Hence, wisdom should not be only a matter of individuals mulling over nothingness in solitude, but primarily a, 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 a matter of collective awareness and action. How does wisdom and action relate? You know, uh, in William Shakespeare's play, As You Like It, a wicked character asked his gentle, modest brother Orlando, Now, sir, what make you here? And the latter answers, Nothing. I'm not taught to make anything. What ma you then? retorts Oliver. Unless we do something, we necessarily mess up something. Hmm. Mesmerized by breaking news, we have become merely gazers and watchers and cease to be merely players. We all remember Shakespeare's saying, the world is a stage and all the men and women merely players. We are no longer players. We are merely gazers and watchers. The endless flow of images unfolding in front of our eyes forces us to ask, what is happening? The, the fundamental question that is being asked now is, what is happening? A question that overshadows other questions such as what went wrong, why it happened, let alone how to prevent it from happening again. These are fundamental questions. What role can wise people play in European context, in our European context, characterized by friction between identities? According to sayings, adages and maxims common to all cultures and philosophical traditions, wisdom consists in being moderate, and master of one's passions. Some etymologies strike us as being of a paramount significance. The Arabic word hikmah, wisdom, shares the same root with hakama, the bit, the steel part of a bridle used to curb the horse. 
Another interesting etymology is the noun wise, wise, which originally indicates a manner or a way of proceeding. From these etymologies, we infer that wisdom is a state of eagerness, of awareness, a tools or means to curb and restrain the self and to make one steer a middle course between extremes. By curbing and restraining the self, wisdom can prevent us from indulging in narcissistic conceptions of who we are. And accordingly, it can enable us to sustain interchange between different entities, identities within European space. The aforementioned unwise obsession with what is happening hinders the deconstruction of the murderous logic of extremists who, by being either ready to die or ready to kill, prove their inability to open a space for viable coexistence and peaceful living together. You know, we are facing two sort of extremes. Some people are ready to die, others are ready to kill. It's a culture of death. More than any time before, European social cohesion depends on stemming extremist impulses and defeating the nihilistic culture of death. It augurs badly for the future of the continent if extremes keep feeding on each other's extremism. It is not wise to combat one extremism by resorting to another extremism, to fight religious extremism by another religious extremism, or by political extremism, for example. But the most dominant form of extremism consists in projecting the enmity of yesterday into tomorrow. We were enemies yesterday, so we shall remain enemies tomorrow. That's a very bad logic. Such a projection predicates itself upon a false assumption of the immutability of both the moral righteousness of the self and the evil wickedness of the other. A preconceived notion of the other as being inherently immoral conforts us into our infatuation with our own presumed moral merits and justifies the deterministic view of historical conflicts and sworn enmities. If Muslims and Jews, Catholics and Protestants, or Islam and Europe have, for one reason or another, fought against each other in the past, there should be no reason they remain locked in perpetual war. Only obscurantist, extremist forces cling to the deterministic conception of sworn enemies. Wise people, on the contrary, do not exclude the possibility of seeing the enemies of yesterday merge into a new harmonious whole. Know that the European space lends itself very well to breaking with the logic of warring identities. If the will to consolidate the fundamental European values of democracy, diversity and human rights prevail over the impulse to disown them. The unwise arguing for the perpetuation of enmities in time goes along with an imprudent call for self-insulation from the outside world. A world assumed to be immoral, barbaric, uncivilized, wicked, decadent or evil. The consistent separation between the self and the other along geographic lines paves the way for xenophobic political thought and condones inquisitional and witch-hunting activity to unveil and expulse the enemy dwelling inside. It provides extremists with a simplified map of a polarized world where geography stands opposite to another geography. For instance, the geography of enlightenment, opposite to the ge geography of obscurantism, the geography of the West, opposite to the geography of Islam, or the geography of faith, opposite to the geography of disbelief. The belief in a pure, self-enclosed geographic space cannot conduce to a climate and a culture of coexistence. Rather, it is a sign of a fragile condition when civilization fails in outgrowing the inside-outside dichotomy and thus gets bogged down in an irreversible process of decadence and decay. When coupled with the notion of pure race, creed and identity, the assumed purity of place does not just shut outsiders out, but also provides fuel for insidious ideologies that are tolerant of hate speech, and calls for deportation and ethnic cleansing. 
obviously. Hate speech is also the result of capitulation to fear or to anger, which is the result of the mayhem born of differences, especially religious differences. To smoothen the course of encounter between different communities, there must be enough room for society to voice reasonable concerns related to minorities. It is not wise to gloss over the thorny issues of migration, of radicalization, of integration, of Islamism, of faith and the European public space, or religion and freedom of expression, for example. We should be exceedingly careful about where we draw the line between outright racism, discrimination, Islamophobic or anti-Semitic attitudes, anti attitudes on the one hand, and constructive criticism or inquiry into the cultural or religious specificities of minorities on the other hand. Often, specificity and cultural or religious particularism are used in minority discourses to counteract the coercive relations of power that claim the right to define who one is. Much as the mainstream extremist ideologies that call for separation between the identities of the West and the rest along geographic lines, some self-proclaimed leaders of Islamic communities in Europe endeavor to fortify the belief in the blessings and benefits of emotional and dogmatic barriers to insulate the Islamic sacred identity against the influence of the European profane world. This kind of separation adds up to an increase of radicalization among the young Muslim generations, for it doesn't open up options of identity or self-expansion for them, but rather restricts these options. In lots of cases, radicalization is the result of the disabling effect of a bitter, deeply ingrained feeling of belonging to two conflicting worlds. In many respects, globalization has blurred the lines of distinction between minority and majority. In today's Europe, one experiences the sense of belonging to a minority and to a majority at the same time. We experience the sense of being a majority, but yesterday I was talking with uh, Ab Samad, our friend from Germany, and they had some problems because the Muslim community within itself, they have a minority. So this is a serious problem. We have the feeling of being at the same time a minority, but a majority. And the Europeans, they have the feeling of being a, major a minority, a majority when it comes to Muslims, but at the same time when it comes to globalization, we are a majority or the uh, minority or European identity. It's something new, <coughs> yes, complex. <laughs> Yet this new situation presents an incommensurable chance to open a new conceptual ground and a new field of action for those who want to think and act wisely. The Brussels Forum of Wisdom and World Peace is willing to address the serious problems that threaten European security and stability, to contribute to building trust in, European, in Europe of tomorrow, where majorities and minorities must join forces to, first, combat the culture of death and consolidate the culture of living together. B, counteract the nonsensical culture of immediacy and instantaneity to restore meaning. Liberate Europe from the shackles of extremism and determinism of sworn enmities to consolidate cultural diversity. Condemn and counteract all forms of violence and division of Europeans along religious lines. Deconstruct the inside-outside dichotomy to enable Europe to interact with the rest of the world. You know, the German philosopher, uh, uh, Friedrich Schiller, used to say that if we fail to open civilization to the outside world, it's a sign of decay. So Europe must be strong, must remain strong, and interact with the rest of the world. Otherwise, it's decay. It's a sign of, of, of retreat. Re-educate young, discontented European generations into new conceptions of faith, belief, and religion, and build an inclusive view of the world. Awaken the peoples of Europe to new wise methods how to inhabit the earth. Not how to change the earth, but how to inhabit it. This requires wisdom. Not to squander our natural environment. 
our motto is neither pessimism nor optimism, but possibilism. We cling to the belief that it is possible to contribute to cohesion, peace, and harmony between constituents of European citizenship. To conclude, allow me to give you a synopsis of the activi the activity, some of the activities the Brussels Forum of Wisdom and World Peace plans to organize in the course of the year 2016 in the hope of opening a new path in a better future. A workshop for young Europeans from different faiths and non-confessional trends or organizations around the following themes. Religion and religiosity in Europe. Then believing and belonging. We between brackets and the future of Europe. We and the future of Europe. Then an international conference to shed light on the following topic, the new migration and its impact on Europe. Then a trip to Brussels, 50 imams from Europe, Precursors of a new religious discourse will be introduced to European institutions. The aim being to introduce them to how Europe defines itself, not only poetically or philosophically or socially, but legally and juridically as well. Because Europe does not define itself only in poetic terms or in literary terms or in social terms, but there is a, a legal definition of Europe. And we must introduce 50 imams who are the precursors of new discourse to what Europe is and how Europe defines itself. So planned is a visit to European Commission and European Parliament. Besides these workshops, be besides three workshops about the renewal of religious discourse. I thank you very much for your kind attention. And thank you very much.